Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Today we've got a very special show, very awesome show. We're talking to Sam from pansofers.com about uh, Maillander, about kerning, about a hidden technique for transformation that's incredibly influential, but nobody knows about it for the most part. Sam is bringing it into the light, an important part of Rosicrucian history. I'm going to stop doing the intro and I'm going to say hi to Sam. Hello, Sam. Hey, nice to, nice to be here. Thank you. Now, before we dive into this, and this might even be one part, two parts, could be three parts, it might be a mini-series. We don't know yet. There, there's a lot to talk about. I find it fascinating. You're going to find it fascinating. The entire point of this conversation is transformation, to bring transformation to the world. Uh, before we can get to that, though, I have to do a quick plug for our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic. We literally do need your help to keep doing the show. Uh, you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that so that we you don't uh, ding your card too much. You can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. I was giving out the wrong address for a little while. And you can also help us out uh, in other ways that aren't financial, by telling people about the show, by sharing it on your social media, by taking an episode and emailing it to someone. You know, this person-to-person stuff, you know, mouth to ear. It's carried the esoteric traditions <laughs> this far, but it actually still works in the modern world for, for getting the word out. Okay, the commercial is over. Uh, Sam, uh, we, we've got a lot to, to talk about. Where, where do you kind of want to start today? Well, this topic, I mean, there are so many things going on right now in the esoteric scene, Rosicrucian tradition especially, um, all, all related to the, let's say, major occult groups. And we have some pretty big claims of Pansifras, you know? Like, we're, we're suddenly are basically saying the secret chief is real, and we've got one, we've pulled him out of the closet, you know? And, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, if somebody had said that, you know, what would you think, you know? Uh, and, and I think you were, you've, you've seen orders do that, right? Of course. Yeah, and, and um, we, we've proven that, that there is something behind the Western traditions, you know? And there are, I think, exciting times coming because, I mean, what is the status right now? I mean, where are we right now in the Western tradition? How, how you know, well-developed are these initiatory systems? You know, what's your opinion on that? I, I've got a lot of mixed feelings. And, you know, I, I know people like uh, who have left the Western traditions because, for Eastern traditions because they see a, a well-planned out system that doesn't have any chinks or holes in it um, that would... that. Uh, that stop, uh, yeah, like th that, that is cohesive, has heritage, and uh, seems to produce adepts. Uh, you know, I, I might have some, some, some conflicts or some uh, different ideas about that. Uh, but yeah, where are we at? Th that's a fascinating question because, in some ways, we're, we're in a new renaissance. You know, I, I'm quite interested in Martinism. I, I got interested in Martinism a long time ago now, and I, I've really seen a, a real blooming in the Anglo world with, with uh, Martinism. I'm seeing more Gnostic churches. I'm seeing more discussion about Western traditions. But at the same time, there's um, a lot of... I'm not meeting a, a lot of accomplished people. I'm not meeting a lot of people who are applying this so-called powerful esoteric god knowledge to their own lives i don't really see them making the the world a better place uh i don't see any real uh, changes in their personalities uh i see a lot of uh again sort of partial systems that seem to only go so far uh and uh i see a lot of the 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 air in the room you know being taken up by stuff kind of tangentially related to the Western esoteric religions, right? So there does seem to be a need for it out there because there has been a, a blooming of occultism. Uh, it, uh, there has been a blooming of, of so-called witchcraft and Wicca. This stuff is very popular. You know, it's in many ways mainstream. Uh, there's out and out witches in any large corporation uh, in professional managerial circles. So it's, it's a real mixed bag uh, at the end of the day, Sam. And uh, I, I guess I have a lot of conflicting opinions. How about you? Well, I mean, these esoteric revivals, I mean, for sure, a hundred years ago, a lot of Rosicrucian orders, occult orders, suddenly appeared. You know, each one claiming to have some special secret, some special secret master or heritage, you know, each one claiming to be the true uh, Rosicrucian group, you know. 
uh, or, or to have a pedigree from the Knights Templars or whatever, you know. And you, you've probably well and truly seen, you know, what, why are these people going to these Buddhist or Eastern mystical systems? There, there is a big factor that after many, many years of going through these Western systems, people get disappointed. You know, a lot of these orders don't deliver on their promise. And in our movement, one of the things we are, um, really started to ask is, well, these, these groups that started, you know, from 1880, let's say, to about 1925, they all claim to be this and that. But how, how especially with the Rosicrucian groups, how much do they really resemble the original thing? That was one thing we asked. And secondly, uh, we started to look at what brings them in common. And then we come to these you know, claims that we, we are making, or me in particular. One was, yes, there is a secret chief. Okay, this can be now be made real. We can prove the history that there was actually some kind of Western esoteric master, at least behind some groups. Um, two, one of the claims I'd like to make today, and I've made a few times, is that once there was a internal spiritual alchemy in the Western orders that was central to the vast majority of, of these Western groups. Okay, and I'm talking the major groups and some smaller ones. I'm talking the OTO before Crowley joined, um, Falcon, Stella Matatina, Dion Fortune, William Gray, they all had it. Um, you know, many other groups, Society of Rosicrucians in uh, America, Max Heindel, um, who else? Some, some more important ones. Oh, there's, there's uh, Krumhaller as well. Um, the list goes on. Tranka, Rudolf Steiner, of course, and, and, and Adiposophy, that's a big one. So somehow, all of these groups once shared this fantastic Western esoteric system. And over time, it's been lost or scattered or broken. And half of these groups don't even realize what they have. And half of these groups don't know how to work it anymore. But it is a genuine system. And it is complete. That's my third claim. Not only is there a universal system for Western spiritual alchemy, but it's complete. Now, people don't have to go to the Eastern systems um, because they can do this. And, you know, I'm not saying, you know, um, we're European, so we have to do Western alchemy, you know, because I'm, I'm half Maori from New Zealand. But uh, some of us have a, let's say, calling or karmic disposition to work the Western mysteries, you know. And in that respect, um, that's why I'm so excited, because things are happening right now. And I think they're going to turn the whole cult scene upside down, to be honest. Very cool. Oh, and, and I want to put, put out a note for the listeners. You know, we're, we don't want to be inside baseball, but at the same time, it would just take too long for us to kind of stop and explain every figure, every movement, every occult term. So I, I am going to do a lot of linking in the show notes. If you're sort of new to some of this stuff, we don't want to leave you behind. I highly encourage you not to turn off the show. Just go with it. And if there's a reference that you're missing, hey, go down to the notes. We'll clear it up for you. Heck, you can email me. Uh, because uh, uh, just the show would be, you know, the, it, it, it would be a, an 18 hour mini series if we if we stop to, to to get really granular with everything. So, uh, Sam, I guess we, we better start with uh, not Mailander, uh, but Ch Mailander's John the Baptist. Uh, who was uh, John Baptist Kerning, if I'm, if I'm going to use the English. Um, uh, Kerning was actually his, his pen name. I only recently realized why he used that name. Can you tell us about Krebs? Tell us about Kerning. Right. So Kerning, essentially, we're talking here 1830s, 1840s. So where most Western orders, you know, start somewhere at the 1900s, actually, we're, we're going right back here. So he um, understood the power of vowels, you know, he was a musician, an opera singer, and of course, music moves the body, and it brings out feelings and evokes things in you. And he was a he was a mason, a mystical mason, and all of a sudden, he delivers to the Masonic world a system of internal spiritual alchemy yeah. that had never been seen before. No one's not quite sure where he got it from. Maybe older sources. He was definitely in contact with Kabbalists and things like that. Um, and in this system he sought to awaken the word. The lost word of masonry becomes um, the lost inner word, the, the spiritual logos, um, divine seeing, divine hearing, okay? The taste of life, the spiritual communication with life, uh, to open your heart and have an internal dialogue. He thought that uh, we could 
enter the inner temple, and he has a very interesting um, poetic description. He, he says to masons, um, in far more beautiful words than I can say, he says, you know, you have not yet entered the temple. You have been initiated, but you have not used the keys. You have the keys, but have not entered the temple. And he's talking about the Masonic signs that you're given. And for him, these initiate processes on the body that open us to the vowels, the effect and power of the vowels that sing and move through us and can awaken the word. So that's basically what he did. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us exactly what this this technique is? And also, if uh, I guess you, you mentioned he uses these Freemasonic hand signs, but I understand that, that he taught a version for people who weren't weren't Freemasons as well. So if you, if you could tell us a, a little bit about, you know, how this works practically, you know, what did people actually do for this technique, with this technique? Right. So first of all, just to bring us back, the reason why we're talking about this is because his system was adopted by the later occult orders and modified and, and joined to sexual teachings and to yoga. But in his day, um, the Masonic signs of the three degrees, you have a cutting across the neck, the chest and, and the stomach. And normally in the original Temple of Solomon, there was a burnt offering or some sort of sacrifice. So you're um, cutting yourself open opening your spiritual bodies and the the um, finger, the index finger is held up high to initiate the eye, the, the number of, uh, the letter of fire, the ignis. And you draw some spiritual force and life to the finger. And when it comes to life, you strike this across the neck. And um, the same is done with the A. The A is given in the hand by holding up the hand in the air. And you open up the chest and same with the O to open up the stomach. So the, the ER are all uh, postures to attune to the forces. And these forces, the ER all, the ignis, the aqua, and the ovum, these are things we already feel and live with every day. You know, you have heat in your body. You, you have life and water and blood and motion in your body. And the ovum, you, you have the sex force in your body. These are things you feel every day. They're in you. But to spiritualize these substances through the vowels, um, he opens the upper torso so that you can receive a holy blessing. And then, you know, with Qigong, um, you know about the Dante and people fill it up. You know, you've got to fill it up with the Qi. Well, his system is a bit like that, but you go down to the feet. After you've opened the upper body, you go down to the feet. Mm. Okay. And you start to fill the body up as a new body of light from the feet. So um, I like to explain it as filling up from the feet because most Variations talk about a golden elixir on your body filling up from the feet, or the Lord will pour out his holy wine and fill you up from the feet. Um, but these Masonic signs, that's not the only system. You, you, you were right. So he had a public system, and he says in this version that women excel and often, um, you know, uh, progress far quicker than men. Mm. And in this version, he's a bit more flexible. He doesn't want to give away Masonic secrets. And he just says, instead of you know, going down the body with the Masonic signs and, and the vows, you can work with the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, to initiate the baptism of light, which is the baptism of water. And as this light descends down your body with the Lord's Prayer, it'll strike upon the feet and your feet will blast and come to life. Now you've achieved the baptism. And that's when you, you know, start to put the vows on the feet. So these vows, I just want to illustrate, just to give people a sense of what it means because if you could dialogue with your heart, if you could hear what your heart really has to say, just imagine it. Imagine if your body could speak, what it would tell you. And in Koenig's system, you know, the body is an amazing thing already, but to bring it to life, the body is in tune with nature. The body is in tune with the word of God. And this, this dialogue, well, um, vowels and consonants is what he introduces to the body. And then syllables and then whole words, and then whole sentences. Now, if you were to teach a child how to speak, you start with basic words, mama, papa, water. So in this, these words are not intellectual things you impregnate into the body. These are feelings. And if you can dialogue through the body and with the body through feelings, well, those sounds and words can come to life and your mind can hear what the body has to say. And that's how the word comes to life. You're actually nourishing your body creating a dialogue it's a bit like my dog I, I taught him to give his paw to have a treat you know i teach him tricks 
But all of a sudden now he comes to me, he's putting his paw up all the time to show me he wants to treat, you see. Um, so we now we have a two way thing going. So um, Koenig's way of work, awakening the, the, the body is um, um, a spiritual rebirth. He says that a true spiritual rebirth has to happen through the body as well. Yeah, it's a, like a, a kind of resurrection, even. Yeah, Would that be exactly. right? Kind of using yeah. using those metaphors and looking towards the Christ story. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, because even though we have stuff like the Gurdjieff movements or Eurythmy, um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, for, for the most part, uh, the Western occult, Western esoteric, uh, Western esotericists are, are very much up here. They're very much in their heads, right? It's often very intellectual. This is often a complaint from people getting into this stuff. Uh, I think you have some, in my views, misunderstandings or harsh interpretations of Gnosticism um, in, in some of the Gnostic traditions when it comes to the body, right? So, uh, yeah, I find, I find this very fascinating. And as modern people, we are particularly divorced from the body. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, after COVID, all of us sort of locked in homes, sort of living these these uh, digital disembodied lives. So to to have something in the the Western heritage that uh, is using uh, terms, letters, words that people know, perhaps uh, using some symbolism that they're familiar with, even if they've drifted away from the church, I, I think there, there's a lot of potential there. Um, okay. The uh, can we talk to I I find origins very fascinating. Not everybody does. <laughs> that I, it's taken me a long time to realize this. That you know I want to hear where where something came from, the possible influences on it, and how it's changed over the years. How people have understood it or misunderstood it. And I always thought everybody finds this inherently fascinating. But I know some people do. But hey, it, it's 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 my show. I'm, I'm the host tonight, so <laughs> I can ask you. Did it come straight from Kerning? You, you mentioned possible capital. Uh, uh, influences because it, it does resemble a variety of other techniques, both from the West and the East. You know, you, you have something similar from the, the Gnostic markets. Um, you have uh, sort of similar ideas in different Kabbalistic systems. Then you can go to, and look at uh, Tibetan Buddhism, where they're visualizing the Tibetan letter A in the throat and also doing inner alchemy. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, and Islamic letter mysticism, of course. So did you know any of the possible influences or, or was it was it just he um, he was doing the Masonic signs and uh, he downloaded this from from, you know, wherever this stuff comes from? That's really hard to say. I mean, when we're going back to the early 1800s, you know, it, it gets really murky. Um, but, I mean, he, he was in touch with Molitor, who was thought to be the greatest Kabbalist of, of um, recent times, uh, who was also initiated into the Asiatic Brethren. But what I'm seeing is Kerning actually was, was sharing his system with Molitor, rather. So, um, yeah, it's very hard to, to trace the origins of his system, to be honest. So, uh, again, uh, we do want to make the show as approachable as possible. I'm going to put some links, I swear. But there's going to be some people listening and watching who are like, oh, that, you know, Sam Sam mentioned alchemy a few times. But isn't that when, like, weirdos in medieval times who didn't know how science worked were giving themselves mercury poisoning in labs trying to turn lead into gold? So can you tell us about this as, as a form of inner alchemy and maybe very quickly give us the elevator pitch about what inner alchemy even is? Well, this, this is a tough one. I mean, the alchemical processes, when, when you talk about alchemical processes, normally, yes, they're happening in a lab. You have a, a burning, a, corro a cor corroding effect, a crystallization. The, these processes um, are mirrored, let's say, in the body. Okay. And as processes in the body, well, um, here we're getting more into the Mylander system. You, you have um, uh, a crucifixion of the body certain things, transmutations will happen in the body, signs, feelings, pains, and revelations work in the body. And these are explained in alchemical art. So um, I could probably best explain it through through maybe the, the Christ forms, which we'll go into later um, from my land. But essentially, um, processes of, of, of burning and melting, you know, the, these are the Western words of maybe what people have in Tibetan Buddhism, maybe what they have in yoga. So if you do dissolve something, you know, and resurrect it um, and distill it, raise it and, 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 and evaporate it so that it becomes a fine substance and goes into the other to contact the hidden light, 
these are all things that you can do um, through your breath and through your blood and experience in your body. That's probably the... All right. Sam, so the, the mysterious name Mylander has already popped up a few times in this interview. Who was Mylander? What does he have to do with the curting technique? We're going to finally lift the veil on an actual secret chief, an actual secret adept in the uh, uh, Western esoteric tradition. So give us a little bio of this, of this figure and uh, uh, tell us who he was and what he taught. Right. So that, that comes a little bit back to our dialogue before. Where, where are all the Western adepts? Where are all these Western gurus or enlightened ones? You know, we've got them on the East. And thank goodness we have one that we can clearly identify as, as um, a so-called Western master. So it's not every day, you, you know, you hear about a real so-called unknown superior secret chief. A lot of these orders claim to have them, but here we um, really have one. When I told Nick Farrell about this back in 2009, you know, because um, that's, that's when I first started working on this, um, it was quite good because he, he, he was a real skeptic. You know, he, he sort of heard about one Golden Dawn order claiming to have a secret chief somewhere else, you know, in Italy. And I, I think you, you guys did a show on that, actually, on Thought Gnosis. Um, do, you, do you remember the conclusion of that? I think it was something like behind some of these groups, they are real humans or what was it? Yeah, that, that was basically the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. So with Mylander, um, there was at... Uh, he, he was born in 1847, 1877. He has a spiritual awakening using the kerning techniques and he revises the kerning system in a beautiful way. OK, he's, he's a Rosicrucian teacher and he goes around teaching and the Theosophical Society get word of him because Madame Blavatsky, she has her Eastern masters. And, you know, you've got Tetuit Bay, the Egyptian, you, you've got these kind of Tibetan Hindu hidden masters. Um, people got a bit fed up with her in Germany. There was a few scandals in the Theosophical Society. And, you know, they broke away from Blavatsky and, and said, you know what, we've got our own master now. See you later. And Mylander became the secret instructor of all these orders. And it's so strange because he swore everyone to, you know, no secrecy. And that's why nobody's heard about him. You know, this is the thing. And I, I maybe you could tell me, I mean, you, you, you are an observer of our blog and I, I don't know how people perceive this, but um, I mean, how would you say the reaction so far has been with the Mylander thing? And I don't know how much people have even got to know about this as well so far. Yeah, no, I, I'm finding it, it, it quite fascinating. Um, and I always like to to find a, a little bit of historical truth in, in some of the esoteric legends and myths that we have. Uh, and, and of course, he, you know, the, the reading a little bit about his bio, um, the, you know, he was, he was a humble basket weaver, right? Uh, and uh, hearing that, that he taught what seems to be a very solid technique that combines some of the woo-woo from the esoteric tradition with what seems to be serious contemplative and meditative work. Right. Uh, does yeah. do, does really draw me in. Now, was was he a secret chief? Was he a secret out of humbleness or you know what I mean? Because a lot of the times when, when there's talk of secret chiefs, it, they're secret because they're these, you know, ascended beings working behind the scenes on a mission from the divine. Right. Well, I mean, here's the irony. They say he was illiterate, you know. Um, he did He did sort of judge books or have access to books. It seems like his group was reading them in sittings as a spiritual circle. But it, for the most part, he's meant to be quite uneducated, quite illiterate. And yet, you know, people are coming from America, from England, branches of the Theosophical Society from all over the place to come and, you know, see this guy and, and meet him and ask, can I be your disciple? So Myrink, Gustav Myrink, um, the author, says he met at least 54 of, of my landed students. Hmm. So it kind of exploded. And um, like I said, it was kept secret. Why? Um, he, he de it seems he, doesn't, he didn't want any fame. You know, he, he had public occultists, especially in Germany, who like to blow their own trumpet. He, he seems to be like, you know, a genuine, um, not, not in it for the money or fame kind of guy, even though he did acquire a lot of financial support because, you know... Um, Merrick Ebhard, Franz Hartmann, and Karl Kellner, the founder of the Order of Temple Orientis, they decide, you know what, this guy's too important. We, we have to do something, put him in a position where he can teach us. So the Theosophical Society get together and basically buy him a small farm. Mm -hmm. 
and and um, liberate him from work. And that's what happens. And he's so busy. He's always writing in his letters. I'm so busy. These people literally won't leave me alone. Um, and in contrast to Eastern masters, you know, you, you kind of have this idea with Eastern gurus that you're going to have an enlightened, serene, peaceful guy on the mountain who's going to say some very ironic but wise words that will change your life. You know, Mylander was quite firm and he wasn't afraid to tell people off if they needed telling off. So um, I think he sets an interesting standard, you know, for, for the Western mysteries as well. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on any figures from the past, any leaders from the past, uh, anybody at all. So uh, anybody listening, please don't take this question in bad faith. But perhaps, hypothetically, it, does it seem that some people kept him and his influence secret because they wanted to present themselves as, you know, advanced spiritual beings whose knowledge really comes from themselves because you, you know you don't really hear it when people are discussing the the technique and some of its mutated forms about about its origins right i i would say people get true to their oaths there are published examples um that mention mylander but not by name franz hartman calls him the german adept um he even publishes whole sections of mylander's teaching without saying where they're coming from there were people um, who kind of transformed him into a theosophical master, um, which I'll go into, particularly in the case of the Rudolf Steiner question, you know, and, and this is where Steiner suddenly announces um, that Mylander, or let's say John, Steiner announces that John the Evangelist has returned again um, and that he's alive today, but he doesn't use the word John the Evangelist. He says Christian Rosenkreuz. Hmm. Christian Rosenkreuz. He says Christian Ro Rosenkreuz is alive today. But if you look at his story, his CRC is John the Evangelist returned. Yeah. And talk about rebranding. Um, Steiner did something very funny. He actually says, well, um, this Christian Rosenkreuz had many students, but only I recognized him for what he really was. Only I knew that he was Christian Rosenkreuz. Now, Richard, Rich, Richard Cloud found that quote. It's gold because, um, for me, this indicates a rebranding of Alois Mylander from John the Evangelist into Christian Rosenkreuz. And, and Anthroposophy um, will have to answer that question. And, and whether or not Mylander was Steiner's teacher um, is something I will address in future because it's a yes, no, actually. Um, you know, a lot of claims and, and absorbing of the heritage um, go into it. So th there's a whole controversy around Mylander as well. And, and um, aspects of the Mylander story actually upset a lot of people as well. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, uh, so you mentioned a few times about him being John the Evangelist. And I, and I believe Steiner taught that that C, the original CRC, the original Christian Rosenkreuz, was an incarnation of John the Evangelist. There is a very old idea that uh, that the beloved disciple uh, reincarnates in every generation, never died, or his spirit descends upon people. We even find this in the canonical Gospel of John, right? It ends with the, the, the beloved disciple, with the editor being like, some people say the beloved disciple never died, but that's an error, which also makes me think, it sounds a little sus. Right. It sounds like you are. It sounds like people back then were, were talking about this guy being around in, in some ways. So, so what does it mean? And, and of course, you know, I'm in the Apostolic Jelenite Church. We really look to both John the Baptist and John the Evangelist uh, in, in our spiritual traditions. What does it mean that he was John the Evangelist? Was he a reincarnation of John the Evangelist? The, is the inner word an aspect of John? Did the spirit of John descend upon him? Do you have any ideas or theories of what was meant by this? Right, Emil Bock, he's Steiner's biographer, he actually says that the spirit of John spoke through Mylander. He was wrong, and I go into that why in my book, because Hartman and, and, and Myrink and others actually say, no, he was John Returned. As far as we're concerned, he was John Returned. Um, so how this comes into play, because when you have sort of, you know, Gnostic succession and, 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 and different, um, upon, you know, uh, successions in, in Gnostic churches, you, you, you have... Um, you could call this almost a Protestant line, okay, to John. And now Jane Lead, um, the theosophist, as in Christian theosophist, she actually predicted soon John will return again and minister a new covenant. She predicted that. 
And then Mylena comes along and he actually is teaching her doctrines in, in his Rosicrucian doctrine as well. So um, the movement in which Mylena was born, this is the, the Jakob Lorber movement, the area where he was born. Biblical incarnations were not unknown because J Jacob Lorber, he even says that Swedenborg was Daniel returned. Mm. You know, so this whole thing in Germany, um, what, what Stein is picking up on when he talks about reincarnations of these saints and sages, this was already considered a fact and, and accepted within mystical Christian circles in the 1800s. Right. I mean, you know, you can see the idea going back very far because uh, the, the idea of biblical characters reincarnating, right? Because, again, we have it in the canonical Bible. It's, it says Elijah returned. Um, you, the, the, we, we've spoken before and uh, to, to reveal things to the audience, but uh, the, something really fascinating that you were telling me about in a past conversation was was these myriad initiators wandering around this part of Germany. Can you tell me about them and what they have to do with Mylander and the Mylander technique and, and this whole thing? Did you say the Mary initiators? Yes. Yeah. Right. So in, in Mylander's community of Kempton, this whole region was swept up in, in a spiritual movement where um, hundreds, about 300 um, Catholics converted, including priests, to this new mystical awakening. Johann Arndt, um, Jane Lead, all that sort of stuff. They were reading it and they got really enthusiastic. And people had spiritual rebirth. They, they taught many ideas that Mylander would continue. And a matter of fact, when Mylander was born, he, he was um, raised and born in a community uh, that, that taught all that stuff. And actually that, that community started in, in the 1790s. So you can actually already trace my land is heritage back to the 1790s, which is quite rare for any of these Rosicrucian groups today. You know, very rare. And he has Presto, this alchemical initiator of his. So in that community, um, you know, Jakob Burma, they talk about this second Sophia or second Maria, um, that Sophia, the Virgin, must be present so that um, she can give birth to Christ in you. Just as you had a historical version you have to have the version today to give birth to christ in you well for them they had these female leaders in their community called um um the mother marys two of them in particular the leader was called joseph and he had two marys and they were also called birthing mothers and they were they had to be present during some sort of ecstatic revelation and they were known to give birth to christ in others you know, and this female, there's a strong female role coming through Mylander's tradition because actually quite often um, females are, are running her circle as well, you know. Yeah. But so, so many of their ideas and doctrines, their, their baptism of water, their rebirth, um, the, the, way, the way they talk about things, that literally is continued by the Mylander. And then, you know, for the Theosophical Society to pick him up in 1886, now you have an intersection. You have Blavatsky's revival, you know, the Western revival, that's happening around the rest of the world, but actually they did come into contact with an old Rosicrucian tradition. Wow. So something, something I'm seeing that, that I'm liking going back uh, uh, to the beginning of the show when we we're talking about where we're seeing the Western esoteric tradition is, is I feel like more people are reading Jane Lead. And I think this is very, very good. Uh, she's come up a few times already. Uh, what does Jane Lead and the Christ forms have to do with my land? All the Christ forms, right. Well, let's start with what Mylander did with Kerning. Kerning is talking about the crucifixions, the flagellations, the carrying of the cross, the bearing of his suffering must take place in the body. But how? It's not quite clear. Um, Mylander sees these things uh, in, in Jane Lee's teaching. She says that you have to bear the dying marks to, to show your spiritual death as part of your rebirth. And these dying marks, she actually says that they can be read and interpreted, they're signs. So for Mylander, he takes her ideas about the transfiguration of the blood and these signs that appear on the skin, and he introduces to the Kerning path. Um, he calls them crucifixion signs. And, and these letters will appear, words will appear on the skin. Um, so many of the theosophists, um, members of the Theosophical Society reported that this really happened. Signs and words appeared on their skin as part of the spiritual transfiguration. They were, um, Jane Leeds said, you would die to your 
um, soul self and sin body. Okay. And um, Mylander interpreted those signs to help people progress as they appeared on the skin, you know. So that's one part. And these Christ forms that you mentioned, well, you know, there's a real spiritual alchemy happening through these Christ forms because Myrick says, oh, I finally get it. You know, he, he studies yoga and tantra and he's sort of fighting with Mylander most of his life and say, oh, this Christian stuff is not for me, you know. Um, but there's, there is a middle ground here where Christ is an initiator in Mylander's path. Christian or not, you don't have to be Christian. Christ can help you and initiate you through this transfiguration. And for Jane Lead, she talks about the Last Supper, that, that the death body um, of Christ, the crucified body, is the first meal in which you nourish yourself and you die with Christ. But then she says, then you have to take up the resurrection body, nourish yourself from that. Then after that, you have um, the ascending body, which she calls the body fit for ascension or the eagle body. Okay, and finally, that's the ascending body. Then you have the descending body, which is the apocalyptic body that's uh, um, born through revelation. It's a descending fiery body of prophecy. So she takes you through this journey of four Christ forms. And Mylander and Myrink express this very well. They say, oh, you know, people only suffer with Christ. And they go around and around circles. They have stigmata and these saints have stigmata. And he says, if only these people having stick martyrs, these monks and saints, you know, they're having all these wounds. If only they knew that they should um, take up the resurrected Christ to continue their, their journey. Yeah. Um, so, so talking about some of these, this bodily pain and uh, perhaps some of these challenges, uh, I already have a bad back. If I start doing this work, am I going to cripple myself doing the technique wrong? If I start at my head instead of, instead of my feet, is my head going to explode? Because, you know, esoteric work uh, kind of traditionally comes with all these warnings, right? Uh, sometimes you also food, uh, find it in other uh, uh, Eastern systems as well. Um, I, I would say the only version of the work people have had, had problem with is the Sabutendor version, mm -hmm. um, which is very mixed because it's got Turkish masonry and it's very mixed up. Um, it's also practiced by by German Thalamites quite a lot, so it's connected to that current. I've only heard people struggling with that one, but I haven't practiced that one. Personally, I haven't had any problems. I haven't had friends have any problems. Um, you know, you work through it, and it can definitely help you. I, I have found samples um, just this week. I, I, I found a, a item written in 1911 where someone actually is saying that he was a cripple you know, and by doing kerning, he fixed his body. So that's the other side of this. Um, you, you won't hurt your back. What I will say, um, because, you know, with Mylander's baptism of the blood, he's, he's saying you impregnate your spiritual experience into the blood. He says the soul is the, uh, the will over the blood and the blood is the will over the body. So his transmutation, you know, a lot of people have astral experiences or dreamy experiences or energy experiences. Myland is actually taking that further through the baptism of the blood. So the first thing people typically experience, you would class as the baptism of water, the descending of light, when you start to have many strange coincidences happen, dreams, sensations, that's the baptism of water. So we bring it into the blood. So you have to be careful what you bring into your body. That's clear, you know. And the only, the only thing I will say, because you're putting letters and, and, and pressing things into your body through the blood, is that um, magic can be quite contrary to the spiritual alchemy. You know, if you're, if you're dealing with a lot of forces and have things flying around, um, whatever it is, go, spirits of the goatee, whatever it is you're doing, um, you have to bear in mind you're drawing your spiritual experiences into the blood. And what do you want to impress? That's all I say about that. And a simple analogy, if you, if you were trying to print, you know, the sonnets of Shakespeare on a printer, but instead of the printer running just those sonnets, you've actually got the lyrics of, you know, some death metal crossing at the same time, what are you going to end up with? So this is, this is how I explain it, because, you know, you're actually trying to have um, knowledge and conversation, the life of the Holy Spirit, and you're actually trying to 
and press this into the blood and draw it deeply into the body for your rebirth. Something that, that I think a lot about is I'm not a monk, you're not a monk, I don't know too many monks, Sam. A lot of our techniques, both East and West, like I, like I teach secular meditation, right? But but some of those uh, techniques are, are based on Buddhist, Theravada, uh, uh, renunciant forms of meditation, which are meant to break your attachments to the world. And if you're a householder, if you need to be in the world, I, I'm not always sure that that's, that's the most helpful thing to be doing. So what did Mailander and his followers think about sort of the, the balance between living, between life and and spiritual pursuits in esotericism? Well, that, that's a huge topic with Bailander because he's basically saying that um, your, your bodily experience and, and your life experience and your initiation um, is definitely achieved through, um, let, let, let's just make it simple. A lot of people want to escape from life or hide from life. Yeah. Um, maybe they want to go into a monastery and hide on the mountain, okay? Mailander, on the other hand, he actually says that the transfiguration, this power of transfiguration, he says it mortifies through life, meaning it kills, it slays you through life. Um, and in this regard, he he closes, he, he stops the separation. A lot of people separate spirituality. They, they you know, they are afraid of matter, the material. Somehow they want to escape um, real life. You know, maybe it'll be, more, it'll be more comfortable to go to the mountain and, and hide from all these terrible things. Mylando is basically saying these horrible experiences you're having, he says, have faith. It's not that purpose. It is preparing you for your rebirth. Okay. So all of our life is a kind of dramatic experience that's initiating us rather, you know, than just sitting down and meditating. And these changes, when you work in Mylando system, these changes that happen to you, um, don't just happen during the meditation. Your meditations and your mystical experiences go with you. And most of the ch changes um, from doing his work occur outside the meditation. They, they happen later. And there's, there's two effects of that. One is that maybe the signs of the blood and the things happen to the body. And the other is that it'll trigger um, lessons in life. Things will happen to show you the way and wake you up um, to certain realities and you know Mylanda he, he comforted people because so many people really suffered and we do all suffer in life you know you're going to get a breakup with your partner your girlfriend your boyfriend your, your dog's going to kill the neighbor's cat whatever you're going to have terrible things happen and all of these things are there preparing you for your spiritual rebirth you know that's what Mylanda is saying you know that might be a, a great place to to stop um, and do you, do you want to come back on the show, Sam, and we can go through some of the... Is, is this Kerning 2.0, Mailander? Yeah, so in my system, I, I classify Kerning 1.0. Kerning 2.0 is Mailander. And then there's a whole other set, series of systems. Do you want to come back on and we'll we'll talk about 3.0, 4.0, and some of the, the descendants and some of the groups and such like that? Absolutely. I'd be glad okay. to. Fantastic. Well, before we go, uh, check out uh, pansofers.com, right, Sam? Which is not just your site for you to give your particular interpretation of Rosicrucianism. Is that correct? Right. We've got authors and, and you know, they're very happy to disagree with me. It's, it's a free location and we're all here to share. And, um, you know, ultimately, it, it's, it's about having a, a place to discuss what we have in common. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, everybody. Well, uh, we'll be back with Sam for a part two, so watch out for that. And thanks uh, so much for joining us, and we'll see you all soon. Bye.